Amen. First Samuel chapter 21. Trust the process is the title of the message. Uh, last week, Dr. Rogers in his teaching mentioned that as we're going through chapter 20 and as I was studying this, it kind of hit me, and I'll get more into it because several years ago, the Lord spoke something similar to me concerning this, and we'll get into that. Um, in chapter 20, Dr. Andre taught us that King Saul was fighting against the will of God, right? Saul was fighting. Why is that? Because God's will was not Saul's favor. Saul realized that the will of God being lived out was not going to be to any benefit of him. Saul was going to lose his kingdom. No longer would he be king, nor would his son Jonathan ascend to the throne of Israel. And I believe Dr. Andre asked you and I this question last week too. How would you respond to God's will if it meant that someone would receive from God what you believe should go to you. How would you feel? Well, I mean, from the human perspective, we can kind of understand, you know, Saul's plight. How would you respond when someone was receiving something that you believed was yours? Now, on the other hand, Jonathan was all for God's will to be fulfilled. He realized this, and he did his best to protect his best friend, David from his father Saul, the king. And along the way, we saw time after time, God protect David as he was going through this testing, if you will, of God's plan being worked out in his life. Over and over again, as Saul was trying to kill David, we saw that the Lord would put people in his life to protect him. Jonathan, his wife, Michael, and Samuel, the prophet, all of these God used to help David. God was working behind the scenes to protect David, and oftentimes he will do the same for you and I, even when we don't realize it. God's working, and we don't always see him. We don't always know what he's doing, but God is moving. And I'm going to just give a a, a brief story of what happened to me years ago. Long before I came to know the Lord, I was living in Los Angeles, and I won't get into grave detail But I was on the streets, didn't have a place to lay my head, and hadn't eaten for a long time. And I was on this park bench, and I was miserable. And across the park, I see this individual coming towards me, walking. And I could tell he was inebriated because he was staggering. And he was walking toward me, and I I was of this fear, like, I really don't feel like being bothered right now, especially by no drunk person. But sure enough, he came up to me. I'm like, okay. He said, hey, how are you? I'm like, I'm fine. He says, "Um, would you like to go get something to eat? Yeah, sure. So I thought he was going to take me across the street to a local convenience store, give me a bag of potato chips and a soda and call it a day. He walked me down to Louisiana Fried Chicken, got me a chicken meal, sat there while I ate, And along the way, you will not believe what he was talking about, as drunk as he was. He was speaking the word of God. God's my witness. He was speaking scripture. Sat there, and then on the way back, still talking to me, made it all the way back to the park, and he said, hey, do you have any money? I said, no. He reached in the pocket, gave me some money. And as soon as he did that, a car pulled up to the curb. He said, man, that's my friend. I said, that's your friend? He says, yeah. He says, I'm from Pasadena. Where we were at, Pasadena is about 11, 12 miles away. His friend came to pick him up. They went to go drink at another friend's place. He passed out. When he came to, everybody was gone. So he just left the house just walking. That's my friend. Thank you. See you later. Bye. Never saw him again in my life. True story. Why am I saying that? Because I believe that was an angel sent by the Lord to speak to me. Now, that was years before I eventually gave my life, but God was working in my life long before I knew it. 
long before I knew it. And your story may not be the same as that, but I'm sure somebody, if not many in here, can tell the story of how they saw the providence of God's hand on their life even before they knew him. Amen? Come on, somebody. Amen. Amen. And so God is working and moving. And we need to know that and believe that. We need to have hope in that. But there's another thing I want us to see here. Unbeknownst to David, God was working out his sovereign plan of redemption for mankind. It was absolutely necessary for David to ascend to the throne of Israel, and God had a plan already worked out before he created the world. God was working in David's life sovereignly because God had created a plan long before the foundations of the world. Genesis chapter 3, verse 15 says this, I would put enmity between you and the woman. This is the Lord speaking to Satan, the serpent. And between your seed and her seed. And he shall bruise you on the head and you shall bruise him on the hill. That's speaking of the cross. Jesus was going to down the cross. And then over in Revelation chapter 13, verse 8, all who dwell on the earth will worship him whose names have not been written in the book of life of the lamb slain before the foundation of the world. God had a plan already to save mankind, and David was to play a significant role in this plan of redemption that God had. And though there were times of difficulty and times of suffering, times of mistakes made by David, ultimately he looked to the Lord for strength. God's plan needed to be accomplished through David. And why is that? Why David? Why was God's plan for David to ascend to the throne of Israel? And why was it necessary? One purpose. Who came out of the lineage of David? Jesus. Jesus. That had to happen. Because Jesus, when he came here, had to show proof of his claim that he is the eternal king on the throne of Israel. Amen? And so God is working and moving in all of this. But what's the point, Pastor? God is moving and working in your life and my life for a purpose and a reason. For a purpose and a reason. We're not here to be hanging out. We're not on vacation. We must be about our father's business. We got kingdom business to attend to, family. And we need to be about that. And we need to be allowing God to work through us to get that done. And I'm sorry for you who don't know, you're not here for your own pleasure. What you mean, Pastor? You're here to do the will of God, amen? You're here to lay it all down for the Lord. And sometimes that can be difficult. Sometimes that can be messy. Sometimes that can be, you know what, man, I just don't do this no more, God. Huh? <laughs> I'm just too tired. I'm so tired. I'm so tired. God, I don't want to do this no more. I'm tired. Oh, I'm so tired. For the one who gave it all on Calvary laid it all down. What does that mean to you? And how much are you willing? to lay it all down for him, for his glory, amen? 1 Samuel 21, verse 1. Then David came to Nob, to Ahimelech the priest. And Ahimelech came trembling to meet David and said to him, why are you alone and no one with you? David said to Ahimelech the priest, the king has commissioned me with a matter and has said to me, let no let no one know anything about the matter on which I am sending you, with which I have commissioned you, and I have directed the young men to a certain place. Uh, David, that's not true. So David goes to inquire of the Lord, and we'll see that later. He's in the city of Nob where the tabernacle is, and he comes in contact with the high priest. And so David starts off his journey as a fugitive doing the right thing. When we're on the run, we need to be running to who? We need to be running to God. 
So he goes to Nob and he inclines and inquires of the priest, but when he gets there, he's not telling the truth. David tells the priest that he's a CIA agent undercover. <laughs> I'm on a special mission. And I can't tell you because if I tell you, I got to kill you. Whenever we're in trouble, it's always good to run to God's sanctuary. David starts out running as a fugitive, making a wise decision. Go to Proverbs 18.10. Proverbs 18.10, the name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous runs into it and is safe. God is our place of refuge. And so that's where David went. In verse 1, we also see that the high priest of Himalek came trembling towards David, probably because he knew who David was. David was a mighty war for the king. David was captain over a thousand men. And so David comes here by himself. And I'm pretty sure by that time, David looked a little bit disheveled, right? He looked pretty toe up. And so him like you're saying, what's going on? Why are you here by yourself? That would be indeed a very odd situation. And David's response to that was not the truth. David claimed that he was on a job sent by the king. Unfortunately, this lie that David told will come back. Turn to 1 Samuel 22, next chapter over. Then David said to Abathar, I knew on that day when Doeg the Edomite was there that he would surely tell Saul, I have brought about death of every person in your father's household. See, what happened was when Saul found out through uh, this individual, his chief shepherd, that David was there, Saul sent men to kill the high priest and his family. But the men would not do it, and so this individual, Doeg, is the one that did it. Eighty-five men, unfortunately, Plus, women and children and animals lost their lives. And so here's the point. Our lives sometimes can be very costly. And sometimes that price may not be the loss of a life, but it might be the loss of a relationship, the loss of a job. And unfortunately, sometimes our life may not impact you, but it may impact somebody else, amen? Amen. And so we need to be careful in what we say. We need to speak the truth. Fortunately for David, he told a lie. Verse 3. Now, therefore, what do you have on hand? Give me five loaves of bread or whatever can be found. The priest answered David and said, there is no ordinary bread on hand, but there is consecrated bread if only the young men have kept themselves from women. David answered the priest and said to him, surely women have been kept from us as previously when I set out and the vessels of the young men were holy, though it was an ordinary trip. How much more than today will their vessels be holy? So the priest gave him consecrated bread for there was no bread but the bread of the presence, which was removed from before the Lord in order to put hot bread in its place when it was taken away. So David asked for food, and the priest says there is only the show bread, the holy bread to eat. And what would happen is, on a weekly basis, the priest would remove the bread and put fresh bread. And then the priest by the commandment of the Lord, and their family would be able to eat this holy bread. And so that's what uh, David was asking for, and that's what the priest said, only the holy bread, the show bread, otherwise known as bread of face. And I'm quoting from F.B. Meyer. F.B. Meyer called show bread 
present bread. That's what it's known as. To eat the show bread was to eat God's bread in God's house as a friend and a guest for the Lord or of the Lord, enjoying his hospitality. In that culture, eating together formed a bond of friendship that was permanent and sacred. Eating the show bread was a powerful way of saying, Lord, I love you and I seek your face. I'm in your presence and I want to be transformed by seeing your face. So this was not any ordinary bread that the priest was giving him. He was giving him holy bread. But understand when you partook of this bread, you were saying you wanted to be in God's presence and you wanted to seek his face that you might be transformed like him. Again, God is working. God is moving in David's life. But David is yet not there. It only gets worse. Also, in Matthew 12, verses 1 through 8, you can write it down, look at it later. Jesus speaks to the Pharisees about this because the Pharisees were rebuking and criticizing that his uh, disciples were breaking the Sabbath. And Jesus uses this passage to rebuke them. And so here's a principle for you and I. What the, the Pharisees were wanting to do was to hold on to traditions. Well, that's how we used to do it. Why are they doing it different? Know this, that man's can, traditions can never supersede God's word, amen? God's word is always going to be above. And that may not fit anybody here. Praise God, we, we're at a church where the word of God is taught on a regular basis, verse by verse, and we have some pretty good teachers here. But there may be somebody that you may come in contact with that may have a different take on that. And I've gone to churches where tradition sometimes trumps God's word. God's word. There's nothing higher than God's word except one thing. He says, my name I'll place above my word. So, David is given this showbread. David also asks, are the men ceremonially clean? And David responds, yes, they are. Now, I want us to see something here also. David didn't just come to the tabernacle and speak to the priest about food. If you would, please, go to 2 Samuel, I'm sorry, 1 Samuel 22, 14 and 15. David also came there to inquire of the Lord. While he was on the run, David still had enough sense to see God and 1 Samuel twenty two fourteen. 14. Then Ahimelech answered the king and said, And who among all your servants is as faithful as David, even the king's son-in-law who, cap, who is captain over your guard and is honored in your house? Did I just begin to inquire of God for him today? Far be it from me. Do not let the king impute anything to a servant or any of the household of my father, for your servant knows nothing at all of this whole affair. This is when Saul confronted Ahimelech about him helping David out and plotting against him. Ahimelech knew nothing about that because David had come. Not only did he ask of the bread, he inquired of the Lord in the midst of of all the lying and deception, David still sought the Lord. And that is a word, uh, again, for you and I. Psalms 119.2 reads, How blessed are those who observe his testimonies, who seek him with all their heart. Jeremiah 29.13 and 14 reads, You will seek me and find me when you search for me with what? All your heart. I will be found by you, declares the Lord, and I will restore your fortunes and will gather you from all the nations and from all the places where I have driven you, declares the Lord. And I will bring you back to the place from where I sent you into exile. We will find the Lord when we seek him with everything that we are and everything that we have. We will find him. Apparently, David had not yet gotten to that point because he inquired of the Lord but yet he didn't turn back to the Lord. And God's word says that when we seek him, when nothing is in the way, 
but just he and you. You will find him. If you seek for him with your whole heart, diligently, God's not playing hide and seek. You will find him. Amen? Verse 7. Now one of the servants of Saul was there that day, detained before the Lord, and his name was Doeg the Edomite, the chief of Saul's shepherds. So here's this individual that I spoke of early who ended up telling Saul about David being there, Doeg. And I don't believe this was a coincidence that he was there because look at what it says. It says again in verse 7, one of the servants of Saul was there that day detained before the Lord. The language is such that being detained before the Lord probably meant that somehow he was ceremonially unclean and he had to go through a cleansing ritual to be right before the Lord. And so there was no mistake that he was there. Probably not for any spiritual reasons because we'll see later on when we get to chapter 22, the character of this individual. And he was the chief uh, shepherd of Saul. And that word chief could also mean valiant, could mean mighty, but it could also mean very, very rough. And so Doeg is there, and he goes on to tell Saul about David. Verse 8, David said to Ahimelech, now is there not a spear or sword on hand? For I brought neither my sword nor my weapons with me because the king's matter was urgent. Man, he's still, <laughs> he's, he's stringing that lie out really good. I have no weapons because I had to get out of Dodge in a hurry. Yeah, right. Uh, no soldier worth his salt would leave without his weapon, right? There's no way he's going to do that. But David had to continue with the, the game. Verse 9, then the priest said, the sword of Goliath, the Philistine whom you killed in the valley of Elah, behold, it is wrapped in a cloth behind the ephod. If you would take it for yourself, take it. For there is no other except it here. And look at what David says. And David said, there is none like it. Give it to me. Is there a sword? That's what David asked. He's a soldier. He doesn't have any weaponry. That's a reasonable request, right? I need a sword. There's nothing wrong with that. Is there a sword? Yes. David's on the run, and he needs to protect himself. And Ahimelech answers, as a matter of fact, David, there is a sword, the sword of Goliath. You remember him, right? You remember him, right? Yeah. Goliath. I'm sure a bittersweet moment for David at that time. And David was glad to have a weapon because he said, there is none like it. So that must have been a good thing. And this has got to be a God thing, right? Mm. Mm. On the other hand, did he remember how he, David, did he remember how he came to win the sword for Israel? Remember that? It wasn't with lies and half-truths. That's not how he got that sword. How did he get it? He did by boldly trusting in the Lord. Amen? So here we have David on the run with no sword. And he's confronted with Goliath's sword. Man, there had to be some emotion stirring up in him. There had to be. And there had to be a remembrance of how he as a little boy with a slingshot won that sword for the Lord and for the people of Israel. David, you've fallen away. It wasn't with half truths and lies, David. I'm going to read a quote from Alan Redpath, and I think it's a good one. I think it's a word for you and I. David lost confidence in the Lord and in fulfillment of God's purpose for his life, which had been revealed to him. The Lord had revealed, David, you're going to be my king. David had lost sight of that. 
He went to God's house for comfort and help and guidance. But he was detected as being wrong in his soul. Instead of acknowledging the truth to the only one who could help him and confessing that he had been telling a lie, hmm, David ran for his life again. He was at the right place. He was at the house of the Lord. He was before the man of God, the high priest. David had all the opportunity, amen, to say, God, I'm telling a lie. Forgive me. But he didn't do that. He grabs hold of the enemy's sword to protect himself from the enemy. (laughs) I got the enemy's sword. I'm going to protect myself from the enemy. David flees. And he takes off. Now it gets worse. It can't get no worse than this, right? Oh, yes, it can. Yeah, it can. It gets worse than that. Verse 10. David arose and fled that day from Saul and went to Achish, king of Gath. Say what? Y'all know where Gath is, right? And y'all know who live in Gath, right? Who lives in Gath, family? The Philistines. Hold on. What? What? David? You leave in God's house and you run into the enemy? Yeah, it's real bad. David is moving further and further away from trusting in the Lord. He runs to Gath, verse 11. But the servants of Achish said to him, Is this not David the king of the land? Did they not sing of one of this one as they danced, saying, Saul has slain his thousands and David his ten thousands? David took these words to heart and greatly feared Achish, king of Gath. So he disguised his sanity before them and acted insanely in their hands and scribbled on the doors of the gate and let his saliva run down his beard. Man, this got real bad for David. <laughs> and spittle running down his beard. Now, I'm going to make a confession. I covet Steve's beard. I think it's a great beard. I can't wear one because I can't keep it that neat, and mine doesn't grow like that because it grows in patches. But can you imagine him walking around with spit running down that beard? That wouldn't look too cool, would it? I don't think so. Now, I'm not saying David's beard was as long as that, but you get the picture, right? A grown man with spit, saliva running down, and he's like, now this is the king of Israel, to be. Okay, I'm running for my life. I go to the Lord's house. I have an opportunity to confess. I don't do that. I keep running, and I run to the enemy, and I get to the enemy, and now I got to act crazy. That don't make no sense, does it? But before we become too judgmental, (laughs) somebody in here has done that too. Somebody done ran to the enemy. Somebody in here done done that. Can you say drugs? Oops. Did I say that? Can we say that in church? Can we say alcohol? Can we say a bad relationship that we know we shouldn't be in, but we go there anyway? And we do that, why? Because we just don't want to feel. We just don't want to deal. And David was at a, a place in his life where he wasn't thinking clearly, obviously, but to go to an enemy, yeah, that's where our lies and our distrust and confidence in the Lord will take us to the enemy's house. Whatever we can find to ease the pain, the feelings, any and everything, but the only thing that can give us what we need and are looking for. There's only one thing, family, that's going to ease that pain. It's only one thing. It's the Lord Jesus Christ, amen? He's the only one that will satisfy. He's the only one that will help us in the way and the manner that we need to be helped. King Achish's Servants 
tell the king that David is among the Philistines and David becomes even more afraid. And then in verse 12, David took these words to heart and greatly feared Achish the, the king of Gath. So he disguised himself, I'm sorry, so he disguised his sanity and began to act insanely in their hands and scribbled on the doors of the gate and let his saliva run down his beard. Verse 14, then Achish said to his servants, behold, you see the man behaving as a madman? Why do you bring him to me? <laughs> That's a good question, King. Do I like madmen that you brought this one to act the madman in my presence? Shall this one come into my house? David pretended to be insane. For sure, David was at the lowest point in his life. An all-time low for David. So let's look at a few things that was going on. Number one, David was alone, right? Number two, he had left family behind. Number three, he was running for his life. Number four, not sure or certain what was going to happen next. He was in a place in his life where, man, what's happening? Not really able to distinguish. Wondering why these things were happening to him. Asking the question, what have I done to deserve any of this? And this was all happening through no fault of his own. David didn't do any of, anything to, to deserve this. God chose him. Chose him to be what? King of Israel. God anointed him. And so David had to be scratching his head like, man, what's up, God? Why is all of this happening to me? What's really going on? David was in the midst of the process. God's sovereign will being worked out in and through his life. Go to Philippians chapter 2. Philippians 2, verse 12 and 13. So then, my beloved, just as you have been, uh, I'm sorry, just as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, Work out your salvation with fear and trembling, verse 13, for it is God who is at work in you both to will and to work for your good pleasure. Is that what it says? What does it say? I can't hear you. For his. For his. This ain't about you. This is not about David. This is about God's will. Well, I don't like that, Pastor. I don't like what God's doing. Oh, well. God was working out his will in David's life through no fault of his own. The process that I'm speaking of is called sanctification. In the word of God in Philippians says, God is working in us as we're working out. We don't work for our salvation but we have to work through it. And as we're working through it, the Holy Spirit is molding us and shaping us to be more and more like Jesus Christ. And that process can sometimes get hot, sometimes can be frustrating, sometimes can be downright disheartening, amen? It can be. It's not easy being a Christian in this world. It's not easy standing up for the right thing. It's not easy accepting God's will for my life. It is not. Sometimes I hate it. But you know what? I would rather be in his will even when it's the worstest time that I'm in than to be outside of it because outside of it is not a place to be, family. Amen? <laughs> outside of his will is not the place you want to be. At least in his will, you know that he is with you. Lord will be with you what? Always even to the end of the age. God is always with us. He's not forsaken us. And so sometimes instead of praying, God, would you get me out of this? I can't make it no more. You know what we should be praying? God, would you walk with me through it? God, would you walk with me through it? You know the story of the, the Hebrew boys when Nebuchadnezzar threw them in the furnace, right? 
And he turned the heat up and he looked in there and he didn't say, well, hold on, there's another one in there. And he looks like the son of man. God was in that furnace. Just like he's going to be in the furnace with you, no matter how hot it gets, God's going to be there. And we need to believe that. We need to trust that. And so David was going through this process, if you will. And so earlier I told you about this process that the Lord had spoken to me years ago. And I was talking to a, actually I was talking to Phil Fiddler, a little dear friend. He's no longer with us. He's going to be with the Lord. But uh, Phil and I were talking about, you know, the ministry of U-Turn and how sometimes guys, you know, will murmur and complain. And I get it. And they don't like what's going on. And I get it. And as we were talking about it, the Lord gave me that. I said, man, you know what? They just need to trust the process. They just need to trust the process. Don't trust me, because if you trust me, you're in trouble. I'm a knucklehead. Don't trust Pastor John, the church. Don't trust God. And in that process, God's going to do what he needs to do in your life. But that's not a word for just men in you term. That's a word for everybody. We need to trust God's process. We need to trust that the will of God being worked out in our life will be not just that his will is being done for his pleasure, but for our good, amen? amen. For our good, not just for his pleasure. And so, David, you need to trust the process. One final verse, and don't tell whoever's teaching next week that I went into chapter 22, but I am. Verse 1, just verse 1, part of verse 1. So David departed from there and escaped to the cave of Adullam. That's as far as I want to go. Adullam. David left that craziness and went to Adullam. Why is that important? Why do I want to go there? Because the word Adullam means refuge. That's what that means. David went to a place of refuge. Finally, God gets David to a place that David needed to be. In a cave? Yes. The cave of refuge. It's in the cave where David begins to seek the Lord. I'm going to go through these real quick. You can write them down, look at them later, or you can look at them up there. Psalms 57, verse 1 through 3. For the choir director set to Al Tashef, a victim of David, when he fled from Saul in the cave. Be gracious to me, O God, be gracious to me, for my soul takes refuge in you. And in the shadow of your wings I will take refuge until destruction passes by. I will cry out to God most high, to God who accomplishes all things for me. Verse 3, he will send from heaven and save me. He reproach, reproaches him who tramples upon me. Selah, God will send forth his loving kindness and his truth. That word, mictum means covering. It may indicate Psalms dealing with protection from one's enemy. God is working in David in this cave of refuge because God is seek. I mean, because David is seeking him. In Psalms 142, verses 1 through 5, a prayer of help in trouble, a miscale of David when he was in, again, the cave. 41, I'm sorry, verse 42, verse 1. Um, chapter 42, verse 1. I cry aloud with my voice to the Lord. I make supplications with my voice to the Lord. I pour out my complaint before him. I declare my trouble before him. When my spirit was overwhelmed within me, you knew my path. And the way where I walk, they have hidden a trap for me. Look to the right and see, for there is no one who regards me. There is no escape for me. No one cares for my soul. I cried out to you, O Lord. I said, you are my refuge my portion in the land of the living. David is right where God wanted him, in that cave of refuge. And in that cave of refuge, David began to do what? Seek the Lord. All the other time, he's running and trying to figure out how I'm going to do this in his own strength and his own power. And you know what? Sometimes, family, God lets us go through this because we're trying to do it in our own way. And God is saying, here I am. You're like, yeah, okay, God, but I got it. I got it. I got it. Until what happens? We come back bloody, 
shirt halfway up. <laughs> because what? We don't have it. And we could have saved ourselves a whole lot of trouble if we did what? Come on, somebody, if we just went to the Lord. But you know what? Sometimes it takes that for you and I. It does. Why? So that God can prove to us in a real way that he's what we need. And in our own strength and power, we can't do it. God had David right where he wanted him. Final thoughts. Trust in the process is not always easy, nor is it always fun. Along the way, like David, you and I make mistakes. But just like God had a sovereign plan for David's life, so he has one for all of our lives. And ultimately, what God was trying to get David to do in the midst of all of this was to look to him, to find a place of refuge where he could meet with God, a resting place. Psalms, one, I'm sorry, Psalms 91, verse 1 through 4. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. For it is he who delivers you from the snare of the trap and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his pinions, and under his wings you may seek refuge. His faithfulness is a shield and a bulwark. Drop down to 9 through 12. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. I'm sorry. I just copied that. I need to go. Typo. Ninety-one, nine through twelve. You have made the Lord my refuge, even the Most High, your dwelling place. No evil will befall you, nor any plague come near your tent. For He will give your His angels charge concerning you to guard you in all of your ways. They will bear you up in their hands, that your feet strike do not strike your foot against the stone. And then. 14 through 16, same chapter 91. Because he has loved me, therefore I will deliver him. I will set him securely on high because he has known my name. He will call upon me and I will answer him. And I will be with him in trouble. I will rescue him and honor him. With a long life, I will satisfy him and let him see my salvation. If we run to Jesus and seek his shelter, he will sustain us. If we run to him, if we seek him. One final verse of scripture, Matthew eleven twenty-eight 28 through 30. Familiar verse to most of us. Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you what? I'll give you rest. That's what David needed, right? He needed rest, but he was running away from God. And there's somebody in here tonight doing the same thing. Instead of running to him, running away. And the Lord's saying, come. Come. If you're weary, if you're heavy laden, come to me. I will give you the rest you need. 29, take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I'm gentle and humble in heart. And you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Trust the process. And if we do, God will give us rest. Last thought. There was a time when I was a young man growing up in Los Angeles, I wanted to be rich and famous. I mean, come on, Hollywood, stars, lights, all that stuff. I wanted to at least attained some things that this war had to offer. Didn't happen. And as I grew older and this world and the things of this world began to eat away at me and tear me down till it was no longer a desire of mine to do that. Because the things of this world are transient and they cannot satisfy and then there came a time when I had nothing. 
and I felt hopeless. Didn't know what to do. But the Lord showed up, and he showed to me one thing that's more important than anything, one thing that money can never buy. You know what that is? God's peace. God's peace. Money can't buy that, family. All the money in the world. And I've been in some places, and I'm not bragging, I've been in some places with rich people. The miserable as all get out. Because money don't buy peace. Peace is priceless. So if you're at a place now where there is no peace, don't be trying to fill it with the things of this world, amen? The things of this world ain't going for a little while. I mean, it's nice to get in a new car, you know, drive around, mm, meet me, look at me. Mm, that's nice. Till you get the first ding on it, huh? Oh, man. It's all going to burn. Cannot buy peace. And the only way we get peace is through who? The Prince of Peace. We run to him. So, if that's you tonight, something going on in your life, well, you need to have some peace. A couple of things. Know this. God's working. He's still on the throne. Amen? Read Psalms. It says, the Lord reigns, the Lord reigns, the Lord reigns, the Lord reigns, the Lord reigns. Right? What does that mean? He's on the throne. He's still on the throne. Number two, he's working out a process. And the process is for your good, even though you may not like it, but it's for his good pleasure. So trust the process. Amen? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you. Your word of encouragement, although, Lord God, it can sometimes be difficult to digest. No one wants to go through suffering. No one wants to go through the difficulties of life. But, Lord, when we put it in a proper perspective, it's those who have hope, Father, that can make it through anything. Those without hope soon give up. And, Father, for those of us who know you, there is hope. You are the hope of glory for all of us. And as we persevere and endure, you're doing a work in us, God. You're molding and shaping us to be more like Jesus. And even as the metal is placed in the furnace and the fire is turned up on it and it begins to melt, that fire gets hot. But in the process of that heat, the dross is being melted away from the metal so that the metal can become pure, so it can be forged into a a pure piece of metal. And the dross will fall to the bottom of the furnace. And the pure metal will rise to the top. And in biblical times, Father, the individual who worked with those metals would turn that fire up until all the pure metal would rise to the top. And he knew that it was all pure when he would look into that furnace and see the reflection of his face. And he knew that the metal was pure. Father, you're turning up the (laughs) furnace of life on all of us, Lord God, and sometimes it's hot. But Lord, you're burning the dross away from our hearts so that when you look into it, the purity of what you want to see is not us, God. You want to see you. And so, Father, help us to just be still and know that you are God. Help us to endure knowing that you're working in us and that we should be working out our salvation. For the process of sanctification will bring about individuals perfected more and more into your glory. And so we thank you for that, Father. We bless you. Give you praise, honor, and glory. Father, help us to be more like Jesus. 
pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.